Welcome back to Mega Mechatronics. In this video, we're gonna look at twin charging. We're gonna really, really look at twin charging. I know I've probably seen all the videos that you've seen on twin charging. I've probably read all the popular articles on twin charging as well. But when you really need to know, when you're gonna build a twin charger and you need to start finding parts and figuring out how to do it, how to configure it, all that stuff is not gonna help you. So that's the problem I ran into. I built a twin charger. It runs. I raced it. I know. I have experience. And I want to share that experience with you. So I'm going to share the, the science behind it, share the reasons why you do it, the different configurations. And at the same time, I'm going to show you how I built mine. And I'm not even done with it. There's different things I want to try this season. So stick around. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and that bell. And if you think I put a lot of effort into this, I did. So I want to prove it to you. So stay tuned. Be sure to hit the like button when you get excited about the information you're learning. All right, here we go. Mega Mechatronics. Okay, folks, let's get into this Twin Charging 101. That is the turbo plus supercharger system for engines. And you can see here is a twin charge setup that I built. So you can see the turbo charger on the left going through a air to water intercooler. And then you can see how that swoops around and feeds that uh, blower right there. So this will be part one of the twin charging 101 series. And I put a lot of time and work into this as much as I could in the time I had. We're not going to cover everything today. This has to be a multi-part series. It just takes a lot of research and double checking and also graphic design and building this presentation takes a lot of time. So I hope you all appreciate that. I want to thank me for doing all this hard work. What you will get out of this is what is twin charging? Why would anyone twin charge an engine? Some research, what we can find, there's actually not a whole lot out there. We'll look at the series or parallel types of configurations with twin charging, sizing of the supercharger and turbocharger, how to build a twin charger. So we'll look at how I built mine. And we'll touch on engine recalibration. So for a lot of you new people out there, I know some of you have been doing this for years. You know, for more years than I've been on this earth, you could have been boosting engines. So what the series is really for is for beginner people, novice people. But you should be open, if you're experienced, you should be open to confirm your beliefs. That's always a good thing. So forced induction or boosting, boosting an engine with a centrifugal or positive, positive displacement supercharger will result in more oxygen available for combustion, more oxidizers. So with that, we need to increase our fuel flow. So if we add more oxygen and we want the same air fuel ratio, we have to increase fuel flow. So you see in that matrix on the right there, we have our air fuel ratio of 11 and a half to one, and that's maintained. On the top level, we have 11 and a half pounds or kilograms of air for one pound or kilogram of fuel. It's a ratio, so the units don't matter because it's a ratio, it's unitless. So if we increase the air flow and we increase the mass of the air going into the engine, we're proportionally going to have to increase fuel flow. So if we increase this fuel, we increase this liquid energy, we get more energy per combustion cycle. So we see this chart down here. That is crank angle versus cylinder pressure. So what we want to do is to increase cylinder pressure. And if we increase cylinder pressure, that's going to put more force on the piston and push down on the crank arm right there and give us more torque to the wheels. And we're gonna take a deep dive into this concept here, just so that you completely understand where we're coming from and understand in general, this is really gonna be 
helpful for all types of forced induction. So we're going to look at why do fluids flow. In our case, with automotive applications, why does air flow? Well, let's give you a definition here. So a difference in pressure is a pressure differential. It's that simple. Don't make it complicated. A higher pressure area has potential energy. And when we release that energy, it's converted to kinetic energy because of the air molecules are, are physical things with mass. That's why it's converted to kinetic energy. And there's a net force from this high pressure that moves the air to the low pressure area. Okay, let's make that a lot more simple. So we have a high pressure area right here. And we have a low pressure area right there. If we create a path, there is going to be a flow. A flow from the high pressure area to the low pressure area. Think of this like entropy. Think of it like thermodynamics, where heat always flows from the higher temp to the lower temp, the higher energy to the lower energy, higher pressure, higher energy to the lower pressure, lower energy. So the larger this pressure differential means there's more energy to flow. So the higher you make that pressure, there's more potential energy, more potential to move that air to the low pressure area. So let's look at more science here. Some I'm going to break it down. Don't get scared away. This is Boyle's law. And we'll watch this animation here. And you can see as the the yellow area so don't just listen to what i want you to focus on so we have our pressure gauge and we have the volume scale so as that yellow area decreases the volume decreases and the pressure increases and as the yellow area gets larger the volume increases and the pressure decreases so as the pressure increases the air density increases you can also see in the animation in the yellow area, the molecules are represented by the black dots, and you can see the spacing between the black dots gets closer, therefore the density is being increased. As volume decreases, pressure increases, we can see that, and then the flip side is as the volume increases, the pressure decreases. Now let's go back to our automotive application on the intake stroke. So here's the cutaway of a piston engine. We have our crankshaft is rotating clockwise in this example. So we could see, let's say the volume over here is 20 milliliters. So the above the piston, there's that volume there. And on the other side with the piston further down, the volume of the chamber has increased to 250 milliliters in this example. Again, as volume increases, pressure decreases. So the volume increased from 20 milliliters to 250 milliliters. Therefore, we have a low pressure area. And now remember, high pressure, higher pressure will flow to the lower pressure. So we just created a low pressure area. So where are we getting this high pressure? We're getting it from Mother Earth. Mother Earth has air pressure. We are floating in a fluid, and it is pressurized. So if we create a low-pressure area, it's the, the air, the atmosphere, is going to flow into it to comply with the laws of physics. Let's look at this concept of this natural boost from the Earth. And it's quote-unquote boost because you shouldn't be using that to describe this. But I'm just trying to help you understand. <clears throat> So Earth gravity compresses Earth's air. Yes, the air is being compressed. And it's being compressed by gravity pulling it down and the weight of all the air on top of each other. And this is how naturally aspirated engines work. They're using natural aspiration. So here's some conversions. One atmosphere is equal to all of those things and 14.7 PSI. What the heck is one atmosphere? One atmosphere is the mass of a column of air 
one meter square column of air into space to sea level. So at sea level, there that that pressure, that force is one atmosphere. And again, to visualize this, that column of air, you can see at in near space at the top of the atmosphere, it's very less dense. And then Earth is compressing the air as it gets closer to sea level. So we can look at this chart here. You can see at sea level, we're about 14.6 in this example here. Up here, as we increase to a thousand meters or 3,300 feet, we would experience, or your engine would experience, about 13.3 psi, and again, 5,900 feet, even less, 12.2 psi. So this is why naturally aspirated engines struggle at high altitudes because there is not, there, there's way less pressure available, less pressure differential. The magnitude, the size of that pressure differential will be different with the same engine and same setup at sea level compared to 5,900 feet. So you're going to lose a lot of engine performance. You're going to lose a lot of torque. So if again, if you're at this high altitude, it's lower pressure. Therefore, there's going to be a lower pressure differential, which leads to a lower flow rate and less dense air charge. And it's going to make less torque. And uh, to further your understanding, let's look at this boost gauge and, and smash any myths that you might believe at this point. So here's some definitions. PSIA is PSI absolute, so absolute pressure. PSIG is PSI gauge. So we have our absolute pressure and our gauge pressure, pressure. So gauge pressure is relative to absolute pressure. So you could say relative pressure in place of gauge pressure. That's fine. So this is actually relative pressure gauge. So we'll pull up our chart here. You see at the bottom this perfect vacuum and it only goes up to 60 PSI absolute. And now you see how the gauge pressure is offset. It's, it's based on the absolute pressure scaling, but it the zero point is offset. So here is Earth down here at 15 PSI absolute. And then here we have our boost gauge. Let's say this is a boost gauge you just pulled out of the box and set it on your table, or you installed it in your engine and your engine is not running. It would be no different. So pop quiz right here. How much pressure? Where would this fall on the scale? right here zero psi gauge because we're looking at a gauge and the gauge is relative to the absolute if we had an you know industrial commercially available absolute pressure gauge there are absolute pressure gauges out there yes that would read 15 psi but we're looking at a relative gauge a gauge pressure because it's literally a gauge and down here where is this going to be? Negative 30 inches of mercury. Correct. It's a perfect vacuum down here. And the final example, 15 PSI gauge is going to be 15 PSI gauge on the scale, which is in reality 30 PSI absolute real pressure is 30, not 15. So boosting does two things. Boosting creates a higher pressure differential across the intake valve. So the pressure in your intake runner and the pressure in your cylinder has a larger magnitude compared to being naturally aspirated, being not boosted. And the second thing boosting does, it compresses your air, increasing the air density. So a higher airflow rate into the cylinder and a higher density charge puts more oxygen molecules in the cylinder for combustion. More oxygen leads to more fuel, leads to more energy released, giving us more cylinder pressure, giving us more torque. And just to note, 
NA engines increase airflow by reducing flow restrictions and increasing the pumping rate, so increasing the RPM. So this is why NA engines have some really high-tech intake and exhaust and, and head, head designs and combustion chambers. They're, they're really high-tech machines, the NA engines. Thank you for watching. Please hit that thumbs up button. And if you want to see the rest of this series, you better hit that subscribe button and hit that bell. All right, see you next time.